Hi, this is Fish and welcome to Fish Picks. Today I'll be taking you step by step through everything you need to know to make your own notched decoder, a useful tool for cracking many of the combination locks you're likely to come across. So let's get into it. I've already released a detailed tutorial on how to open the Masterlock 175 Magnum, both without any tools, but also using a decoder to determine the position of the gates, which in turn reveals the combination code. If you haven't seen that episode, I'd encourage you to do so before watching this one, because it serves as a useful primer to combination lock design. I actually own two commercially available decoders. There's my Sparrows tool, and then more recently I picked up a notch decoder from Covert Instruments, which is the company promoted by the lockpicking lawyer. The notch in this design allows the user to grip a sprung plate, which is a key component of many wall safes, to help effect an open. I spent a fair sum of money in picking one of these up from the US, and the import and postage charges ended up being three times the cost of the tool itself. And then, just a few minutes of use saw it get snagged behind one of the dials of the first lock I tried to use it on, and when I finally managed to free it, it was ruined. This isn't a criticism of the tool, they're necessarily thin, and they are going to get damaged, particularly as you're learning how to use them. But, given the expense and the fragility of these tools, I decided to try and find a cost-effective way of making my own, and this is what I've come up with. I'm going to show you exactly what I did to make each of these designs, and while I admit they're not pretty, as you'll come to see, they get the job done, and I'm reasonably happy with these as my first attempt at making a picking tool. I started by getting hold of a set of feeler gauges, which formed the blank from which I cut my decoder profiles. Then, using the tools which I already own as a starting point, I created a template with the following proportions. The length of the feeler gauge I used is 70mm, and I wanted the shaft of the decoder to be at least 40mm in order to be able to reach far enough into the majority of commercial combination locks that I've come across, so this left just 30mm to form part of the tang. While I would have preferred to have a full tang tool, I thought the scales and the bonding agents which I was going to be using should be sufficient to give the tool structural integrity, but when I make more of these I'm going to make sure I buy longer gauges instead. The width of the shaft design is 3.5mm, allowing it to slip easily between the wheels of even the smallest lock models, and the tip is a hybrid between the gentle rounded curve of the Covert Instruments tool and the sharper lines of the Sparrows decoder which means that the tip is narrow enough to drop into the small gates on a lock wheel, while it won't be weakened unduly by the notch. The notch itself needs to be deep enough to be able to hook the edge of Rialto lock plates, so I'm using a 2.4mm diameter hole with about half that depth at play. And now to an important consideration, the thickness of the tool. Sparrows use a 0.2mm stock, while Covert Instruments is 25% thinner still at 0.15mm, which I found to be a little flimsy, so I used 0.19mm feeler gauge, which is thin and flexible, but still strong enough to hopefully have some longevity. Taking the feeler gauge and clamping it to a wooden backstop, I first drilled the hole from which the notch would be formed. Then I took a pair of strong crafting scissors and cut along the centre line bisecting the drilled hole. This allowed me to create two blanks from the single strip of metal, which was useful because I wanted to try out two different kinds of handle. Once I cut out the rough profiles, I tidied up the edges of the tangs using a mini lathe, which I've recently picked up and I'll be doing a review of this soon. I simply attached my grinding and polishing wheels to the head of this tool, and this freed up both of my hands for more precise and safe work. Once I was satisfied with the shape and the finish, it was time to turn my attention to making the scales for the first decoder. For the first design I decided to make a reusable silicon mould so that I could easily produce more tools in the future, so that meant a bit of an upfront investment but it would be worth it over time. I took a two-part mouldable silicon putty and kneaded them together thoroughly, 
And then once the compound had been formed, I had about five minutes before it was going to harden. So if you're doing this, it's a good idea to have everything on hand before you begin. Then I took my Sparrows decoder and I pressed the scale into the mould up to half of its depth. I like the dimpled design on this tool, which makes it great to grip and it sits comfortably in the hand. Now, obviously, this is a Sparrows design, but I'm only making this for personal use, so I'm ethically comfortable with my choice here. Nonetheless, I decided to remove the keyhole logo from the mould detail before leaving the silicon to cure. Then I took some heat activated plastic granules. The brand I'm using here is Thermoworks and the product is called Blackmorph, but there are several other brands available. They become soft and mouldable once placed in hot water or when submitted to direct heat for a few minutes, but the material then hardens when cooled again, making this product ideal for this kind of project. I'm using black granules, but you can buy them in a transparent form and then use colouring dyes if you want to play around with different designs. Having warmed them sufficiently, in this case I used a silicon poached egg case and a heat gun, I made sure that the granules were sufficiently softened and then I rolled the plastic into a ball and kneaded it to remove any air pockets before I pressed it into the silicon mould and left it for a few minutes to cool. I made sure I pressed the plastic down into the mould firmly to get as much of the surface detail as possible. Once cooled, I removed them from the mould and trimmed away some of the excess moulding with a craft knife and then sanded it to shape each scale. Although I did find that it tended to shred rather than reduce to powder, so it was difficult to get as nice a finish as I would have liked. I then used JB Weld to bond the scales together, inserting the decoder blade in place and clamping them before leaving them to cure overnight. I didn't film this last stage because I try and keep my glues and filming equipment away from each other and the lighting in my workshop isn't really suitable, but I'm sure you get the idea. Finally, I took a satin finish black spray paint and having taped up the blade of the tool, I gave it a light coating to create an even finish. The result is a solid tool that feels good in the hand. On reflection, it's a little thicker than it needs to be, and so I'd fill less of the mould next time or sand the scales a little more for a more slimline grip. However, I was also keen to try an alternative handle design, which I came across on Lock Noob's channel, where he uses zip ties to create some pick scales, which I thought was a great idea. In this case, I used 12mm wide plastic ties and cut two 8cm sections, which I taped together and then shaped on the mini lathe. Once I had a decent profile, I switched to a polishing wheel to take away some of the burrs. And then it was simply a case of covering the ridged internal faces of the ties with a bonding agent, again I used JB Weld, inserted the decoder profile, and then again clamped the components together and left them to cure overnight. After a final sand and polish, this is how it turned out. This decoder is a lot thinner more flexible and certainly easier to make, and I'm not sure I have a preference at this stage between the two. I had to ignore my perfectionist tendencies because neither of these are finished to my satisfaction, but nonetheless, I had produced two homebrew notch decoders and it was time to put them to the test. I used this wall safe made by Master Lock and set the lock to an unknown combination by changing the dials before scrambling the wheels whilst they were facing away from me. First, I wanted to try to decode this lock using the tip of the tool. To that end, I inserted the decoder to the right of each wheel and then rotated the dials one position at a time while feeling for a bump or an indentation which might indicate that I'd found a true gate. This particular model has a small protrusion as the telltale sign. And once I'd found this feature on each of the four dials and lined them up, I secured the open in relatively short order. So far, so good. The advantage of this method is that it places very little pressure on the tool, so you're less likely to damage it. Depending on the model of the lock, the alignment of the gates might not mean that the wheels are yet in the right position to affect the open, and so you may need to then progress all of the dials by one and test the release button until everything does line up. In this case though, this step wasn't necessary. 
There are, however, some wall safe combination locks for which it's harder to discern the position of the gates, and in this case an alternative method is required, and this is when the notch method comes into play. I once again reset the lock to an unknown combination, and this time I inserted the tool with the notch facing up and to the right and uppermost part of the second wheel. The aim here is to guide the decoder up and under the plate in a scooping motion until you can feel the notch hook into place. Then I gently pulled the plate towards the wheels and turned the first dial one position at a time until I felt a point where there was a lot more play back and forth. Often you can feel the dial fall into the gate using this approach. At other times it produces a more pronounced click as it sets. Once I felt that I had decoded the first dial, I then moved the decoder to the right of the first wheel, re-established the grip on the plate, and advanced each of the other three wheels until the feedback indicated that these two were correctly positioned. To be honest, I found this a much trickier technique, and while this footage makes it look relatively straightforward, I worked at this for a few hours and I found the results quite inconsistent. Whether this is just a lack of experience or indicative that my profile design needs refinement, I'm not sure. The lockpicking lawyer makes it look easy, but then he makes everything look easy, so I'm not going to give myself a hard time over this. It's another technique which is worth a try if the first method isn't working out. Given how easy these methods are and how well known these design flaws are becoming, I would definitely think twice about securing keys in this kind of a lockbox if it were in plain sight of my property. A four digit lock like this has, in theory, 10,000 possible combinations, but as you can see it can be bypassed very easily with the right tool in hand. Thanks for joining me today. Please do remember to hit the like button if you've enjoyed what you've seen, and until next time, Take good care.